Welcome to the latest edition of the Shukri Rights Podcast with your host, Shukri Rights. Today, I'm particularly excited to have this tremendous radio personality in Boston. She is the (laughs) co-host of the Get Up Crew. You can hear her weekday mornings from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Hot 96.9 in Boston. Melissa Iannuzzo. Hello. What's going on? I am very excited. I am so happy you invited me on. So thank you. It is very nice to meet you uh, through video. I know we've tweeted a few times. Um, Remind me, when was this? Because I was like, wait, hold up. Okay. (laughs) So I saw you. So, of course, my friends, the Wongs at Kowloon. Oh, yeah. Someone had either retweeted or something that you were there and you were eating the saga or you had just tried the saga swings for the first time. (laughs) And I think I tweeted back. I was like, wait, you just, how long have you been in Boston? You just tried the Saga Swings. I was a little disappointed. But then I was asking you uh, if you would like the Saga Swings. I think that was like one of our only interactions. But then, yeah. Wow. Gee, Mm -hmm. I was wondering like, wait a minute. Because when you (laughs) told me that, hi, I know, I know you. I'm like, wait. Yes, because I remember we tweeted. That's how I saw. I think it might have been Kowloon that, it had that to tweeted be. that you were there, and then I was like, "Wait, did he just say he's just trying the Saga Swings?" I'm like, "Okay." Yes. So, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Did you like the Saga Swings?" And like, oh that was it. God. So, yeah. Amazing. Tell me you like, liked them though. Okay, it was, I was gonna it, say, Melissa, it was incredible. And for those mm-hmm. I don't know what we're talking about, so true oh, yeah. story. It's on my Twitter page. Um, last June, I went to Saugus for the first time and went to Kowloon's. Actually, correct. I went to Kowloon's for the first time in Saugus. It mm-hmm. wasn't the first time I was in Saugus. Last time I was yep. there, funny enough, was actually Valentine's Day weekend 2016. Oh, And I remember that weekend quite well. It was actually very cold. And I was visiting okay. at the time. And um, But I went to Kowloon's for the first time and I've heard nothing but amazing things about Kowloon's you gotta oh yeah you gotta go try the the saga swings you gotta go try the poo poo platter and in you know, and a mai tai and I was like okay 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 and I gotta give a shout out to big Jim Murray and as well as Joe Murray and a, a few other um person love Jim love hub. Joe yep yeah and um good people yes and um I tried it I tried the wings and my reaction my video went viral is really the first time that i ever <laughs> went viral i mean the video had at the time it's been months but it's, at the time i had like twenty five thousand views Shut i up. kid you not no it's there i, I kid you not i was just i shocked. gotta see it go ahead like i was it's like just, an out-of-body experience it isn't was. It? like they're that good <laughs> it was like by the way this podcast is not sponsored by kowloon we're just t- you know i know i i know and it's like people are gonna be like wait a minute it's just that good yeah, you know, you know what's you know what's funny. I had a couple people from from New York that came up to visit. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my brother and his now is now fiance. Yeah, they came up and it's like, shoot, you gotta take us there for for our anniversary. And I remember saying we're gonna do it, and we did. I went up there. It's like maybe a few weeks after I went up there for the first time. Yeah, and the owner Andy Wong recognized me. He was like. I, yeah what's going on you're back I'm like yeah and I brought friends this time and they're like it, it's like is there is it the first time coming here and like yeah and they're like oh my god I'm like yeah he, he hooked it up didn't he oh did he ever the <laughs> are the best I have brought yes. so many people through there and they're like oh you gotta try this oh you gotta try this I'm like oh my god yeah they take care of you for sure absolutely good people Absolutely. And I'm glad that they are absolutely want to be staying open a little longer because there was a scare. I know that was so scary when they said they were closing. I was like, I wait, know. what? Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah Hopefully this... it's not for a very long time. Yeah, me, me too. Me, me too. And a few days ago was uh, what was International Women's Day and you yes. being a woman in in radio. Yes. What does that day mean to you and what type of significance does it hold for you personally in your life? Whoo, that's a great question. I think, well, first of all, us, me being a woman and, you know, representing uh, women are the most powerful force on the planet. Um, I think that it's, it's taken a very, very long time for women to get the respect that they deserve. And I Mm -hmm. don't think we're there yet. I think we're getting close, but I think that, you know, we're creeping along. 
Um, and I think that there's so many women out there that do such amazing things in every field, uh, anything when it comes to, you know, radio or, you know, TV, movies, doctors, lawyers, like it's, women are just doing so many more great things now than ever. And it's just so nice to see them finally getting recognized for it and equal pay and, you know, all that stuff that's just been preached over the years that I feel like is finally coming to fruition. Although again, like I said, we're still not there yet. There's still work to do, but I, I think that, you know, we're moving along and I, there's a lot of amazing women that I look up to personally, um, that have paved the way for, you know, other women. And I also, I'm a coach. I coach cheerleading. I volunteer coaching cheerleading. I've been doing it for like 18 years and one of the most amazing things and rewarding things for me is seeing the, all the athletes I've coached years later and them coming up to me and saying, you were such a great role, role model to me. And I look at them like, wait, really? Was I? And it's just, it's <laughs> funny. Like, but, but honestly, like yeah. that right there is the reason why I do it, you know, and just being able to inspire and stuff like that is huge for me. It's huge. And like I said, because there's been so many women that I've looked up to, looked up to over the years that, you know, it's very important, I think. Who is the most influential woman in your life that help, has helped you get to where you are now? My mother, hands down. I know that sounds corny and I know obviously she wasn't in radio, but my mother taught me everything there is to know about just going after what you want, not taking no for an answer and working your butt off to get what you want. My mother was one of the most hardworking women. She pretty much raised my brother and I by herself working three jobs. Um, and she never quit and she never let it show if she was struggling or if she was unhappy, never let it show. And I learned everything about working hard from her. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be doing half the things that I'm doing. I know that's a very cliche answer, but it's really a hundred percent real. If it's a hundred percent real, then by all means, it's, it's your story. I, I'm not yeah. looking for like the juicy, sexy answer. Yeah. Like, give, like, give me the, give me the 100, give me the real. Absolutely. And, and if, in fact, this, if your mother was the most influential force in your life, then absolutely that I want to, I want to learn more about it. In fact, Growing up, what was one of the more striking and yet powerful lessons that she instilled in you that mm -hmm. has that has shaped your, your your personality and as well as your mindset? Probably that I can't take things to heart and that mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to please everyone. And I've had to take that over my radio career uh, so far because especially in this day and age of social media. Oh, yeah. Everyone's a keyboard tough guy. Everybody wants to let you know how much they can't stand you. What you said on the radio today was wrong. It was bad. You're a bad person. Like everybody wants to try to cut you down. And my mother always said to me, you're not going to get to, not everyone's going to like you. That's number one. You can't please everyone. If you try to please everyone, you're going to kill yourself trying. And at the beginning, it was really hard. But I finally got to a point where I was like, you know what? I really don't care. Like these people that are whatever, it, it, I don't care. The people that are the ones that are enjoying what we're doing, listening to our show, saying how much they love it and how much they laugh every morning and they go to work and they, they look forward to their ride to work because they love listening to our show. They're the people I care about. And my mother used to always say that to me, like, not everyone's going to like you, Melissa. You can't make everyone like, you. I'm like okay. I'll try. But obviously, yeah, it's impossible. So especially like social media, as you, as you perfectly alluded to, like everybody, <laughs> everybody's like, a lot of people are keyboard warriors. And it's just like, yep. at, at some point you you learn to develop like that tough skin. And yes, and it like, took a while. I'll be honest. It took probably like 15 years. What, what, like, what changed that ultimately? Um, I mean, I'm not going to be honest and say it sometimes still doesn't hurt because it does. Course, yeah. Um, but as you get older, I think, I think it, you just get to a point in general where you just realize life's too short. 
like you start to see, unfortunately, things happening around you, like tragedies happening around you. And you just get to a point where you're like, I really don't care. And in the grand scheme of things, these people that are trying to be cut you down are going to have no significance in my life whatsoever. So at some point you just get to that where you're like, I, life's too short. I don't care. Like, you know what I mean? I don't think there was anything. I don't think there was any one specific instance. It just kind of grew. It took a long time, but it just over the years, it, you know, it happened. As you began your journey, where, like, how, how did it first begin? Like, where did your love for radio, like, come from like like was there an early uh life like influencer that that you know inspired you to get into radio and if so who was it no actually it's funny uh i was always a fan of music my whole life growing up i i loved music it became a huge part of my life and i remember i'll never forget this i was driving um to work i was 17 or 18 i was going to a part-time job And I heard on my favorite radio station at the time, them saying they were looking for interns. Mm. And I didn't even know I could be successful in a job in radio. I had no idea. So I called and I got an interview. I went in, I interviewed, they hired me. And I became an intern for years. And I legit would go in every day just saying, hey, can I help? Can I help? Can I help? Work my butt off for free just because I wanted to be around. And then when a job as a producer opened up I was the first person that they called and my boss then is the same boss I have now however many years later I won't say how many but um (laughs) big shout out to Cadillac for giving me a chance and um yeah it's just I kind of just when you say I kind of fell into it I did kind of fall into it it wasn't something that I said to myself I'm gonna be on the radio one day and never said that (laughs) it was more so my love for music that you know propelled me. And then because I was doing morning radio, it then became my love for just, are we allowed to swear on this? Probably not. Yeah. So I'll no, say, no, you are. I can. It's, it's a podcast. Okay. All right. <laughs> just make it sure. I don't know. I don't know if, we, if you want to piss off any sponsors. I, I had, right, look, Melissa, I, I had Craig Carton of WFAN two, ep- okay. two or three episodes ago. Yep. Let's just say it's there's 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 a few uh, expletives in okay. there, and I, I just had also Christian Arcan and Sean yep. Silva on the last episode, so like okay. you're you're good. Perfect. Yeah. So morning radio, I love to shoot the shit. I love to just talk shit, and like that's what we get to do. And yeah. then when I found out, wow, I can actually make a living doing this, that made it even more enticing for me than just the music. So now I can be involved with the music and talk shit at the same time. So it's like, what more could you want? <laughs> and it's like a perfect combination like absolutely and when, you, and when you and when you happen to to find that passion for what you do it makes it makes what you do all the more enjoyable it doesn't feel like work and in it fact, doesn't it, in fact you said something that really stood out because i really want to harp on this point that you made about working for free i'm a big proponent in which that you have to be willing to set aside your pride in order yes. to get to where you want to be and to achieve what you want to achieve. What is what message would you share with people that have a tough time setting aside a pride, their pride and saying, I'm not willing to do this for free. I want to be, I want my money. I want to get paid. Yet they, they find themselves kind of like running, running a muck in a circle, if you will. I would tell them, well, you know what? You can keep that mentality, but just know that for that mentality, there's 10 people out there that are willing to do that job that you're not willing to do. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like that was always my goal, my drive. And and the reason why I was so driven was because I knew if I didn't come to the station every day to offer my assistance, somebody else would. And then when a job opened up, uh, who's going to be the first person they think about the person that's there every day, that's working their ass off. So if that's the mentality you want to have, and I know a lot of people now have that mentality because mm-hmm. they're like free work for free. I'm not going to do that. And that's fine. But just know that for every person out there who's saying they're not going to work for free, there's 10 people out there that will work for free and that'll get that job that you're looking for. That's all. Absolutely. It could, because I saw something the other day on, on social media that really irked the hell out of me. And it was about unpaid internships. Whether they, I saw, I, I saw and, the exact and, thing and you're I, talking about. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, I actually want to, I actually want to touch on that with you because this is where like my passion will start to come to surface, if you will. Like yep. I, I'm, I, so far I've been very, 
relax, chill. But but something really struck a nerve in which that I saw a bunch of 21, 22 year olds and I'm not degrading mm-hmm. 21, 22 year olds. I mean, I was 21, 22. I'm 20 right now. But it's just something about unpaid internships. I should be paid for the work that I'm that I'm doing and so forth, regardless of whether if it's radio or television or et cetera, yep. et cetera. But it bothers me immensely when I see and hear people who are that young, who are unproven, who haven't even begun to carve out a niche, if you will, speaking mm-hmm. in, in those terms. So my question to you is, how do you begin to influence and teach the people who are in that generation mm-hmm. to say, hey, you know what? Nothing's going to be given to you. It may be uncomfortable at first, but if you're willing to stick through it, you will reap the rewards. That's a great question. I feel like, yeah, there are a lot of millennials that have that mentality, but I think that there's also a lot that don't get the recognition that are hardworking and driven and will work for free. They're the ones I think that that people aren't recognizing because people like to harp on the negative. Sure. Um, we There was an internship class that came in through the radio station not too long ago, and there was probably... 15 or 20 of them. And this is obviously before the pandemic. And um, of the 15 or 20, there was probably five or so that you could tell just had that drive because they would, they stayed behind and they were asking us questions and they were writing notes down and they were like, oh, can I give you my card? I really want to come in. I want to shadow you. Like, yes, there are going to be those groups of people who you're not going to really change their minds. No matter what I say, if I sit here and try and preach to someone, it's not going to get through. But there's still going to be that group of people, that small group of people that know what they need to do and will work hard and do whatever they need to do to get where they need to go, where they want to go. And those are the people that you'll see, you know, progress and make it to the top quicker. Absolutely. Tell me about your upbringing in Boston and what that and what that was like for you. Well, I grew up in the small suburb of Boston called Maynard. Very small town. It was like 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And it was just, I don't know. It was boring. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I love my town where I was from, but like there really wasn't much going on there. Mm. It was music and sports and that was kind of it. And every chance we would get, we would go into Boston and go, when I turned 18, I remember us going to this club, um, Mojo's it was called. And then there was stocks and bonds. And then, you know, we would just, me and my friends would just go into the city. We would meet people and we would go to clubs, stuff like that. It was just, it was just very like your typical suburban growing up, like boring town. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, And yeah, there just really wasn't, that's kind of probably how my love for sports came in. Cause I was a jock kind of, you know, and I loved playing sports, but I also loved watching sports because it really much wasn't much else to do. Mm. So, and that's how I kind of just fell in love with all my Boston teams. And, you know, it's just kind of how it felt, fell in. Like which, which sport did you gravitate to the most? Football. I'm diehard football. I, I just, I could watch sports. I could watch football all day, every day. I don't care who's playing. If it's college, I don't care if it's Pop Warner. I mean, I just, I love the game. I love it. And so I was a cheerleader. Like I, like I said, I coached cheerleading, but I was a cheerleader in high school, but they would get pissed at me because I'd always be want, wanting to watch the game. And they'd be like, we got to do it, you know, whatever. <laughs> we got to cheer. And I'm like, I don't care. Oh, I'm watching. I'm like, it's fourth down. Are you paying attention? Like they'd get so pissed at me. <laughs> But that was always my thing. So I was always kind of like, you know, yeah. the, the, the jock and, you know, whatever. <laughs> so so, so yeah. like when you, you mentioned you, you coach cheerleading, you still, you still coach yeah. cheerleading. Like, where did you get your love for cheerleading from? And how much did it influence you, while, especially while you were in high school? I was always a dancer. I loved dancing. And then, I don't know, I cheered in high school, but it wasn't very competitive. But then as I grew up and then I started like coaching like Pop Warner and then like middle schools and high schools. And then it started becoming more and more and more competitive. Mm. Then I started to learn more and more about it. And I was coaching with the best coaches I've ever seen in my life. 
And it just became more intense. You know, it wasn't just for fun anymore. Now it's like, okay, we're winning national championships. For sure. And the competition part of it is really kind of what intrigues me about it. And I just, I love it. And I, I still coach Pop Warner. I've been doing it for 18 years, like a volunteer mm. job. But then I also coach all-star cheerleading, which is very competitive, mm. um, where we travel all over and we compete for national championships and world championships and this and that. So it's just the competitive aspect of it is what drives me. But of course, I also still love, you know, being able to see kids that I've coached years later and saying, wow, you know, you're really a role model to me, which like I said, it really surprises me, but, uh, (laughs) that part of it's so cool to me too. But yeah. Like, why does it surprise you when people come back to you so many years later and say that, you know, you really inspired me, you impacted me given that. No. (laughs) So, okay. One thing that you'll know, anyone who knows me knows I'm not good at taking compliments. I'm not good at recognizing when I'm good at something. Why? Uh, I'm, I'm more of like a self cutter in a way where like I'm more apt to believe the bad things about me than the good things, mm. which it's terrible. It's a terrible habit. I've been mm. working toward trying to fix that about myself, but that's just how I've always been. So that's, I don't know. I, ugh. Like, what, like why, why are you so, so reluctant to the brush aside when someone gives you a compliment or versus when someone says something bad about you? Like, I why? don't know. I, I, it might be maybe a way of like a defense mechanism mm. to be kind of like, oh, well, you know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not great. So you don't have to expect much from me type of thing. Mm. I, I don't know. It's a horrible trait to have. And that's, probably one of my, I have a friend who's always telling me, stop being so self-deprecating. And I don't understand why I'm like that. I really don't. As many times as I'll get compliments about anything from, you know, being on the radio or like my coaching ability or just, you know, my overall just presence of whatever. It's just harder to believe that stuff than it is to believe the bad stuff. And like I said, I'm working on it. Talk to me next year. Hopefully I'll be in a better place. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. <laughs> most, most definitely. Um, I mean, listen, at the, at the end of the day, like I just not, not, not pushing anything up against you at all, but just as a, as a general point for me is like, at the end of the day, like we all want to, you know, hear like, like hear like, you know, be, you know, say, Hey, like, you're doing a great job. Like you're doing right. this well and so forth. You, you know, like, I mean, uh, my co- constructive criticism, depending on where it's come from, can be actually be yeah. a good thing for you. Yes. And, when you first began your radio journey, like who were the people that oftentimes lent you a, a helping hand to help you develop your on-air talent? So number one, Ralphie Marino. So Ralphie was uh, a DJ in Boston radio for ever. He was on the air when I was growing up listening. And um, it was back when it was when it was WZOU, he was on WZOU. And then when I turned to Jammin, he was on Jammin. And I interned for him. And he, the number one thing that he said to me that stuck with me to this day, and he still tells me to this day, he'll send me messages all the time. He just says, don't fuck up. That's it. So anytime I was ever thrown into the fire doing anything, whether it was production or, you know, running the board or doing whatever, it was just like, he'd text me, don't fuck up. Or he'd call me, don't fuck up. I'm like, okay. And he's down in Florida now. Um, he's not even in radio anymore, but he just left radio within the last year. But to this day, he's been probably my number one influence. And um, of course, my boss, Cadillac, and even my co-host, Romero and Pebbles, to, to a point, because they were both working at the station with me when I started. I learned a lot from both of them. I mean, Romero is one of the most hardworking pr- people I've ever met. In, in every aspect of life, not just radio in regards to him being a dad in regards to him in health and fitness, just in general and Pebbles, same thing. I mean, she's a legend in Boston radio. You know, I've just being around the two of them for as long as I have has been, I've been so fortunate to learn so many amazing things from them as far as work ethic and, you know, Everything from, you know, just showing up on time, making sure you're not late to, you know, uh, 
just again not fucking up that's like I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll always go back to that because that's just the way it's kind of like you know what I always look at when I'm working I always think of that in the back of my head absolutely now for every story has a beginning and I'm curious to to hear your story as to how like how did the get up morning crew come to be and and like, like, when did you first meet Romero and Pebbles as well? And, and how did you three become such a, I would say in more ways, become like an iconic uh, morning, morning radio personality in the city? So we met when I started interning at our old radio station. The two of them were already working there. Actually, Romero was an intern as well. And Pebbles was working there already. She was already doing the morning show there. And then I became the producer of her show um, with Balthazar, who was on with her at the time. And Balthazar left Jammin, and then they ended up putting Romero in. So it became Romero and Pebbles, and I was their producer. So that's how the three of us started working together. Then it started where they wanted a third voice, and it wasn't just me doing production. It would be me lending my voice to pop culture things, because I was kind of more in, into the pop culture at the time. Um, and then I just kind of became a third voice. Then when Pebbles and I were actually let go from Jammin at the same time, it was sort of a thing where they just didn't want to renew our contracts. It's actually interesting story. Mm. Our boss at the time, Cadillac, he had left and he went to New York and started the breakfast club down at power in wow. New York. Yep. He started that morning show. Then the boss who came in, obviously wanted to go in another direction. So that's why Pebbles and I's contracts were not renewed. We left. And then within two weeks of us leaving, we had heard a rumor that there was going to be another radio station coming into Boston and signing on. And at the time, Cadillac was not involved. Um, but we were talking to the general manager at the time, uh, Rob Williams. Mm -hmm. And he was like, listen, we have a new station that's going to be coming on soon. We'd love for you and Pebbles to be a part of it. He was pretty much like, I can't really tell you that much about it. I can't tell you because he's like, we don't have the whole team together yet, but we'd love for you to be a part of it. And at this point, I was scared out of my out of my ass because I was unemployed for the first time. Wow. I don't know what the hell I was going to be doing. And I'm like, you know what? If I can have an opportunity to stay in Boston and still do what I love to do, I'll take it in a second. So I came in, we signed the station on, found out later that Cadillac was coming back. I couldn't believe it. Like, think about my boss wow. that brought me into the business leaving and then me going to another station and then him coming back and working with us again. It was insane. And so at that time, though, I wasn't doing mornings. They had me doing afternoon drive by myself wow. and they had brought Balthazar back to be with Pebbles. But then he ended up leaving again. And then Romero wasn't working out where he was. He wasn't happy. And then it just so happened when he was done there, the opportunity came up for him to come back here. And then the three of us all ended up back together. So the timeline might be off in some way, shapes and form. I'm so bad with remembering things in certain time, but that was, <laughs> that was kind of the gist of it. So like I was going to ask like, 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 so like how many years have you, have you three been working together? Like doing Ooh, mornings now? That's a good question. I, see, again, I'm so bad at time. I don't know. I, <laughs> Oh man. It's been maybe yeah. like 20, 15, wow. 15, maybe 15 years, maybe. Wow. I'm so, but you know what? I'm going to go in tomorrow and I'm going to tell Romero what I said. And he's going to be like, you're an idiot. It's been X, Y, Z. So bad. <laughs> if you were to ask me like when the Patriots won their first Super Bowl or, or no, the Patriots. Okay. 2001. I would know that. But like, if you were to tell me like who the Patriots play in the 2000 whatever Super Bowl, I wouldn't know. I'm just so bad at time. When did this album come out? I don't know. Like, I'm so bad at knowing times and years wow. and stuff. That's just not my forte. It's terrible. It's okay. Like, listen, I, I, dates and times is really my forte. Like, it's okay. Perfect. It's Good. It's, it's, it's crazy because like I actually um on on this morning's radio show on 91.5 FM WMFO, I specifically was harping on the time and the fact that we are now entering the one year anniversary of the beginning of this pandemic. And, yes. and it's, it's, it's mind blowing. I want to come back to the radio discussion, like just, just after this, but, but this particularly, I, I couldn't, 
do the podcast without making some sort of mention of this. March 10th of last year. And this may this may be challenging, but that's okay if you can't answer it. But what do you remember most, especially leading into the beginning of the shutdown of the world that I mean that that we once knew it as? Mm, that's a great question. I don't see. I don't really remember like what I was doing or where I was, and so I just remember people brushing this off like it was no big deal and that we weren't going to mm-hmm. have to shut down and you know it, you know oh don't worry about it you know if we do it'll be two weeks and we'll be right back to normal again and the one vivid thing that I can remember is at this point trying to go to the grocery store and get certain things and you couldn't oh I remember that too paper oh, yeah. towels uh sanitizer was huge and you couldn't get it at this point oh, I remember. but it's still at this point there were people that didn't believe this was going to be a big deal you know mm-hmm. and yeah like i'm a okay so i'm a big fan of going to the casino i love encore i'm there a lot before the <laughs> pandemic i was going a lot yeah so i would go there and i'd be like oh little did i know that the last time i'll, I'll never forget I forget which Celtic player it was. One of the Celtics was in the VIP room and got it, he got diagnosed with coronavirus. Ooh. And I'll never forget them saying, if anybody, whoever was at Encore, March, it was March, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, whatever, one of the Celtics has it now and he was there playing. So you should probably go get checked out or whatever. I don't think I was there that day, but I was there, I think maybe the day before, the day after. And I was like, oh my God. Do I have it? I don't, do I, you know, that was one of the things I remember doing sure. yeah, yeah. before they shut everything down. And mm-hmm. then, yeah, just people not taking it seriously. It's, it's wild because I remember um, a couple of days before, like my mom was, she, she, she watches the news. She's like into new stuff. And, um, and one of the things that she told me was, you know, you, you need to go and buy like, hand sanitizers while you still can and it was just like yeah it was just like and here i am i'm talking without a headphone so i can't even <laughs> like total blooper total blooper so like <laughs> have at it ladies and gentlemen have at it um but um but i remember just thinking hmm hand sanitizer i wash my hands like when i go to the bathroom right i mean but yet again it's like dude you see people walk in, handle their business, and walk right out as if nothing yep. happened. People yep. are unsanitary, unfortunately. That's just call it for what it yeah. is. Oh, yeah. So at this point, I remember, like, we would we would be on FaceTime, and she's like, you need to go to Target. You need to go go get the nap right now. And I'm like, Mom, I'll be You fine. weren't listening to Mom, I were was, you? I wasn't. No, I wasn't. And it was just like. What exactly am I need? Do I need to worry about? I do the same yep. thing every time I go to the bathroom. Wash yep. my hands. That's what you're supposed to do. But I'll never forget this in particular. Um, the day before the Rudy Gobert um situation arose, which yes. really was yep. the which is the one year anniversary of it is actually the next day after this recording on March 11th. Oh shoot! Yeah, it's and I will never ever forget where I was and what I was doing and what's crazy about this now I, I did not mean to turn this into a long-winded answer That's or okay. response but I was on the green line true story I was on the green line heading to the garden because at the time I was working as part of the ball gang and mm-hmm. which will change over the garden floor from Bruins hockey to Celtics basketball and concerts right. and so forth yep I earlier in the day, I was at Roxbury Crossing and I got a text from someone at the garden saying, hey, um, we have in, we have a, a special shift tonight um, of, you know, Celtics floor already been put down because they have a Friday night game, which was supposed to be Friday, March 13th. Would you be interested in coming in from like eight hours? Hell yeah. Give me my money. Shut up. OK, let's go. I'm on the train now. It's like maybe 930, 945. The shift was from 10 to 630 a.m. Mm-hmm. And phone buzz from ESPN. Rudy Gobert tested positive for COVID nineteen. Adam Silver announces NBA suspending the season indefinitely, and I'm like, I'm "Yeah, sorry, what? Oh yeah." And that was the moment when I realized 
this is serious. Okay, um, so when they're I, shutting down games, oh yeah, yeah, and it was at this point, it was like, and I can't help but just think about this. I'm like, I'm on FaceTime, and I'm like, this is serious now, isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah, like, and I'm like, okay, I got inside the garden, and I'm in a state of just absolute just shock, and I'm like, guys, did you not get the news? They're like, no, what are you talking about? Like the NBA season has been suspended indefinitely. And they were just like, are you serious? You're like, yeah, right. Like, yeah, yeah, right. Like, are you serious? Like you're shutting down. They're basically going to stop the season because of, because of the flu. I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't think this is a flu. Yeah. And and, and, and what's, and what's ironic about this. And I'm, and tell me if you, if, if you talked about this with, uh, with Romero and Pebbles on the morning show or not, Remember the whole biogenesis? Um, yes. A like meeting at the at the Long Wharf. Oh yeah, we talked about it. And when I first heard the story, I was like, "What the what the hell were you guys yeah. doing that?" Like it just blew my mind. Like, what Didn't do you remember they say about like that? Like three hundred thousand people got it from that. Yes. Something yes. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's insane. That's crazy. Talk yeah. about super spreader. Yeah, yeah, and it blew my mind. I was like, "What were you guys yeah. doing?" Like that could have led to. Some, yep. some this one event alone turned out to be like the the super spreader oh, that yeah. we didn't know it at the time. So I I'll, I'll ask you this: like, so the following day mm-hmm. after mo- the morning after the news broke about Rudy Gobert getting testing positive and and the NBA season suspending its season indefinitely, what do you remember most about that about that morning's radio show and discussion? Because I'm sure it had to be a point of discussion at some point. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think we were just kind of like in disbelief. We were just like, what is happening? Like, and I know Pebbles is somebody who has been, I don't want to say scared, but she's been very, um, taking this very, very seriously. Not that we weren't, right? but she was someone who didn't even want to leave her house. She's like, I'm not going into work. Like, do we go into work? What do we do? And, um, you know, I'll be honest, I felt the same way, but on another hand, on the, on another sense of it, I live alone. Work was, everything else was shut down at the time Mm -hmm. or going to be shut down. So if I didn't have work and being able to go into work, I had nothing. Am I going to just sit in my house all day, every day and talk to the walls? I'm like, (laughs) no, I need to, I need to continue to live some kind of normalcy or I'm going to like I don't know. I'm just going to lose my mind. Yeah. So I, I wanted to continue to go into work. Romero did too. Pebbles. I know she was more timid. Like I said, she, she wanted to stay home and it was more so we were just talking about how we were feeling uh, as far as, are we scared? Like what is going to happen here? Like are our loved ones going to be okay? And not long after I had a very good friend of mine, almost pass away from COVID. He wow. ended up, I'll never forget it. He got it. And he, within three days, he got into a coma and wow. he was in a coma for six weeks, six weeks. And I found out on the air and his brother had texted me and told me what happened. And I was like, I got to go home. I can't stay here. Like, this is crazy to me. And I think at that point, I really realized that this is bad. This is bad. Like it's going to start to hit home for a lot of us when you have good friends, relatives that are now dying from this. And it was just, you know, we, we talk about like being serious on the radio or like entertaining and making people laugh. Our number one goal is to always make people laugh. That's what people come to our show for. But this was a time where it was like, you know what, we need to, you know, inform and let people know that it will be okay, but to be safe, you know what I mean? I'll just, I'll never forget that part of it. It was just, it was very real at that point. So, yeah. One of the most surreal memories that I I will always have from the first week plus of this pandemic I'll never forget this. Now, I had um, gone into the garden for the for, for the last time about a week later. I think I believe it was March 18th. Mm-hmm. At this point, 
the NHL had announced that they were going to be suspending its season indefinitely. Yep. All, all sports basically followed suit the very next day, which, yep. which, by the way, I was on the radio airwaves on that day from 12 to noon. And it was, and I tell people this all the time, and, and I still stand by it a year later that it really was the most surreal broadcast. And I normally talk sports from, from wall yeah. to wall and I'll, and I'll add an even like human interest stories I uh, hear in there as it pertains to sports, mm-hmm. but this, but on this day, I, I'll never forget this. I was on the air for two hours and, and literally while I was on the air and I had the monitor up in front of me and news was breaking in real time. I was like breaking news. It, this is just in commissioner. Gary Batman has announced that the NHL will be suspending its season indefinitely and it was just like one. Can you believe the, it? I couldn't believe it. It's like happen- dominoes. It really was. And it, I was on the air as it was happening. And so that particular show meant so much to me, not so much in terms of just sentimental aspect, because we were talking about this. This was history that we're that we're dealing with. Yeah, I, I kept that broadcast in its entirety on my computer. And it is just it's one of those things where. A year later, I, I really believe that there are people, whether if it's on the air or off the air, they are now beginning to have those conversations like, we really have been in this for a year. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it does Can it still shock it? you. Yeah, does it still shock you at times? Yes. Like, I'm literally sitting here like, wow, we've, this, it's really been a year. And the sad thing is that we're not even out of it yet. That's the sad thing. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. I see that we see the light at the end of the tunnel, but we're still not done. Cause it's like, to me, we'll be done when we don't have to wear masks anymore. Yes. Mm-hmm. When we can go to sporting venues at hundred percent, we can mm-hmm. go to concerts at hundred percent. And they're saying that's not going to happen until 2022 at mm-hmm. least. So yeah. until that happens, we're not done. And you know, that's a sad reality, but it's like, you, you do have to kind of look at some positives that we are being able to, they're starting to open things back up. And now you can go to sporting events at the, you know, Boston where 12% yeah. capacity. Yep. Like, mm-hmm. so yes, we're getting there. It's just slow. And it's like, we were talking about it this morning, actually saying how when they first shut us down, it was like two weeks, that's it. Two weeks. And we'll, we'll, we'll flatten the curve. <laughs> we'll get through this in two weeks. Comedy. Remember that? Comedy. I remember. Mm-hmm. And now a year later, we're still like, I can't believe it. It's crazy. It's it's mind blowing on so many levels, because at that time, even my close circle of uh, friends and family, they were like, hey, just be a couple of weeks. At, at worst, a couple right. of months. And I'm like, right. hmm, <laughs> OK, sure. But. One of the fun, one of the lighthearted story, stories that I have from that, it was, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, I was mortified of going to the supermarket so much so that I avoided going to the supermarket initially. And one, one of the, yeah. one of the most memorable runs that I made to the store was I I used to go to the Target uh, right by Fenway, that mm-hmm. one right, right off right off of uh, Brookline Avenue. Yes. And I'll get there, and it's like maybe midday, and I'm thinking, oh, there's still there'll be stuff be in there. So I'm strutting my my I'm strutting my way in there, like yeah, it's gonna be stuff here. I get in there, and this show this shelves are completely cleared, and I'm like, oh yeah, what the hell? Oh yeah, you're not believing Ransacked. your fellow human beings, like yeah. toilet paper gone. I'm like, yep what yep. about what about everyone else and you had to be strategic about when you would go to try yes. to, plan it to be like okay the least amount of people are going to be here on maybe wednesday at like 11 o'clock yeah i remember that and then when you would go to the supermarkets and you would see lines like down the street of people oh, waiting yeah. to get in mm-hmm. remember that oh yeah that terrible. especially I was like, oh, there's only 50 people in line that's not too bad okay i'll go like i, I- <laughs> That was Jesus. That was terrible. I mean, remember, especially I don't know if you if you uh, ever passed by like a Whole Foods and you see like the lines that'll just yeah. extend it. It would just be oh like, yeah. No, I can't. No way. Mm-mm. Yep. No, no way. Yep. So as far as 
as far as like the radio show is concerned, and even for you personally, what were the early days of the pandemic like for you professionally? And what were the, some of the challenges that you had to overcome? Um, I think, well, it, it, a lot, in a ways it made it easier for us because, um, well, we would go into work. It made it easier because, uh, we were the only ones in the building. So mm. they made everybody stay home. So all the salespeople, all the bosses, they were all home. So we were kind of able to go in, focus, do our thing without any distractions. Not that people being in the building is really a distraction, but right. like it was just, the building was empty. So we mm -hmm. could kind of just go in, focus, get our job done, do what we had to do and leave. Um, the thing that it helped that there was no traffic. For sure. Not that going in at the times we go in, there's no traffic, but leaving, sometimes there might be a little traffic, but we would go right in at like five. We would leave right at 10. Um, and yeah, that, that part of it was cool. The thing that was a little bit of a challenge though, was that the engineers also weren't in a lot. And so if something went wrong, we'd always have to call people and say, hey, we need this fixed. Like, can you either come in or can you, you know, they'd be on call. They just wouldn't be in the building a lot. So that was a little bit, but it was, you know, we made it through. Nobody would ever be prepared for something like that. No way. Nobody. Mm -hmm. So as much as we were like, yep, we're ready. We're good to go. Like, we'll be fine. There was always some, something that would come up that would be like, oh, we have to kind of overcome this now and oh, we have to do this now. So um, but we always did. And I will say that our, our company was amazing and still is through this pandemic. They built up plastic dividers between us and the studio. They have um, the sanitizers come in um, at least once a week and from ceiling to floor, they would do the whole studio. Um, they have a temperature taker right when you walk in and you have to take a temperature. If you don't, you don't, you're not let in like little stuff like that, that they're doing to help keep us safe. And I think has really helped, um, you know, and is still in place. Like now there's only, I think they only allow 25% in the building right now. Mm. So yeah, people are slowly starting to come back in, but it's still not anything like it was pre pandemic. And I don't know when we're going to get there. So, but we will. <laughs> I, I believe, I believe that we know that we certainly will at some point. Yeah. And, and like one thing that, that, that I'm really like intrigued by is every person has a story from from during that time because in more ways than one we, we're we are in the media and in more ways than one radio was hit hard during this pandemic yes. and yes. unfortunately we saw a lot of people either be put on furlough or lose their mm -hmm. jobs yep what is what what was one of the more jarring stories that you've that you've read of you've come across or people that you either made know or may may be aware of that that you heard and you say my god this this is just god awful especially in a time where like you you're not even sure like what was going to be happening next i think just in general, the layoffs and the furloughs, like you said, I don't know if there was any one person specifically, but each, nobody was free from it. Each radio company had a massive layoff and, or furlough. And I mean, we all didn't know what we were going to, you know, if we were going to have a show, we, we had no clue. We just, we were taking it day by day, like everybody else. And, and it's, it's just hard because you're looking at revenue going down, 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 our listeners going down, down, because- wow people listen in their car. Most people are going to listen in their car on the way to work. Guess what? No one's working. Guess what? People are working from home. So they're not listening to the radio the way they used to listen. So it was scary. It's still scary. Like radio, like you said, has taken a very, very big hit. Um, you would like to think that when things get back to normal, people are still going to look for their local radio and their friends on local radio. Yeah. So you would like to think that that's still going to be the case, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, ratings are all across the board and every radio station has been affected. Um, so once we start getting things back to normal and people start going back to work and they're commuting again, 
<laughs> things should hopefully get back to where they were, you know. In terms of content, like how how are you, Ramira and Pebbles, able to continue to provide content on a on a day to day basis during this pandemic, especially in the first let's say first three four months where practically everyone was by and large part home working from home. Well, we would include the listeners and stuff a lot. So, okay. If they're not listening, they're on social media. Mm. So I run the social media handles for the morning show and we would constantly be engaging with the audience on social media. So we did a contest where we were having people come up with a song, uh, to kind of like, uh, tell everybody to keep washing their hands. Like, all right, who's going to come up with the best song telling people to wash their hands. <laughs> so every day we'd be playing these people come up with the stupidest, most hilarious stuff. And we'd play it and we would do stuff like that. Like every week we would get people engaged on social media by either asking questions like, you know, what are you guys doing to pass the time? Who's been laid off? What were you doing? You know, just getting them engaged that way. Um, and that was, yeah, like that's, there's always people that want to get involved in the show sure. through social media. So that was kind of like a big thing that we would do as far as looking for content, but the world is still going around. Like just because the world kind of stopped, it's still, it's people still are evolved. still living their lives. Mm -hmm. So there's always something fun to talk about. There's always, you can always look at idiots in Hollywood doing stupid shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> will like oh yes like something stupid happened the kardashians did something dumb awesome okay there's our content today you know what i mean and you know there was always something to pull from and if there wasn't it was just okay let's be relatable how what are we doing when we leave work today what are we doing we're going home and doing what nothing okay so let's relate to our audience that way you're doing nothing we're doing nothing all right but we're going to entertain you the best way we can and you know for me, my highlight of the pandemic was I redecorated my apartment. Ooh, <laughs> I was saving okay. some money. So I went out and I spent it a little bit. I got a big screen TV. I got an entertainment center with a, an electric fireplace. I got pictures and mirrors. And like, I just, I'm not a decorator. I don't, I don't do that. But I had a friend come and help me. And I, you know, my apartment's very small, but I was able to do, you know, a few things here and there. So that was kind of the highlight of my pandemic. So it's just like keeping people entertained be relatable and get them engaged as much as much as possible through social media. And that's something that we're still doing today, you know? Uh, absolutely. In more ways one, I think it's become even more important now more than ever to continue yeah. to keep people engaged, especially when you're, you're, we're in a time where we are, we're, we're still searching for answers and, you know, we're looking for different outlets to keep us going. And even, even as things begin to open up and, you know, like, especially, um, in a time where the digital age has yep. become never, it's been never, never been more important than now, especially yep. during a pandemic. And the one, the one question I'll, I'll ask you, and I, and I thought about this, I said, you know, every format has its Titan, if you will, or, or, or the person or persons that has, you know, like jump started this particular format and the format that you work in, who would you say is the, biggest influence on the format in which that in which that it has led to the profound success of pop culture and entertainment being on the radio airwaves i mean the easiest answer to give and i think is the most accurate one would be howard stern i mean you're talking about radio specifically like radio or pop i was for your for your format for, for your format in particular. Oh, you're talking specific. about for, oh, for specifically for like rhythmic, like ry rhythmic top 40 yeah. type radio. Yes. Mm -hmm. And as far as somebody who influences it, not necessarily in radio and in, in radio on air or even off oh. air. Yeah. Oh God. That's a great, I mean, you can always say Ryan Seacrest. I've thought I about mean, Ryan Seacrest before, but I was like, yeah, but I'm not really sure. Like, like, it, is it I'm just him or I'm only saying that because he's got his hands in everything. Yeah. Like he's, he's got a huge production. Like he, you know, he's responsible for the Kardashians. Like he's got his radio show still, you know, he's got American Idol, every single TV show he hosts. He's got, you know, the E while he's not doing the E thing anymore, but like, mm. you know, the red carpet stuff that he does, like, 
he's just got his hand in everything. So I feel <laughs> like it would be yeah. remiss to leave him out of a conversation like that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I don't know. Do you think, can you think of anybody else? <sighs> wow. Um, Ryan, it's tough. It's, it really is. I, I don't know why, but I, I was thinking about like the early days of like, WBLS I can I grew up in New York but yes. I born and raised so like WBLS yep. I think of like okay late 90s early 2000s that like they were the station um like to, to tune in and listen to like and oh, man I mean I guess for if you're if you're a certain age you think of like the breakfast club or right. or like yep. you like you or you think of like um like Ebro, uh, Rosenberg, yep. and, you know, mm. Hot 97 and so forth. Yep. Like th those are people that I would like, I guess, think of, I, I guess, because maybe, maybe yeah. my, my memory, it doesn't go beyond further than maybe 2002 in that regard. or, or Right. Whatnot. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, here in Boston, of course, you have Maddie in the morning. I mean, he's a legend yeah. here in Boston mm -hmm. and somebody that everybody knows and has grown up with and is still doing his thing to this day. So, I mean, he would somebody be somebody locally that, you know, I think is the epitome of what Boston radio is. And, you know, it's just what everybody knows, sure. you know what I mean? So that would be someone locally. I think you could throw, throw in there too. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And last question I'll, I'll ask you, and I want to, I want to th throw a fastball in there. Okay. I'll have fun with this one. Okay. So when you when you look at radio currently yep and and the demographics that that of, of people who listen to 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 radio and and versus like how it's consumed whether it be like traditional radio or like why or like was it digitally how important is it to be able to find like a like a balancing act in terms of keeping the keeping the audience engaged knowing that the attention span for a lot of people mm. is not as long as it once was yep. versus, Hey, like, you know, our, our steak and potatoes still come from um, the people who tune in like via yep. radio and not like via streams and so forth. So it's funny because, you know, back in the day before streaming and all that came around, we always thought about who our competitors were and our competitors mm. were always people on down the dial. You know, we're competing against every other radio station in Boston. Now we consider our competitors to be cell phones, you know, mm. smartphones, uh, podcasts, YouTube. Um, those are our competitors. Yeah. So the way I look at it is the way that people kind of reference cable TV and local TV channels, right? Yeah. So people are going to always, although cable TV is probably not a good reference now because a lot of people are ditching cable TV, unfortunately. I think yeah. that's it is what it is but people are going to pay for their streaming services they're going to pay for it to get their extra stuff that they want to listen to and watch but they're always going to come back and they're always going to want their local fun you know in regards to tv they're going to want their hbos they're going to want their showtimes and espns and all that but they're always going to come back to their four fives and sevens and 25s because they want their local, they want their local personalities. They want to know what's going on in their hometown. You know what I mean? Sure. And that's kind of the way I see radio. Yeah. People are going to be still listening to podcasts and watching YouTube. I mean, I do it, but I still want to hear my local personalities and what's going like. I listen to the sports hub all the time. Like yeah. when I'm in my car, that's what I'm listening to. So it's, you want to hear from your local personalities and their take on what's going on in the world, whether it be in sports or whether it be pop culture, whatever it is. Um, when I go home, yeah, I'll, I'll go on YouTube. I, YouTube is one of the only streaming services I'll actually pay for. I get the premium so I don't have to look at ads. I'll be on YouTube all day when I'm at home. But when I'm in my car, I'm listening to my radio and I'm listening to my local radio. And I feel like, yeah, radio is being threatened by a lot of different angles coming from all different angles but i think there's always going to be a need for it i for really sure. do absolutely absolutely last one if you could leave if you could leave a message of inspiration for any for any woman who is looking to get into radio 
Mm. What would you what would you say? And, and like, what would your words of encouragement be? Don't take no for an answer ever. That that's that's number one. A lot of radio is still not looked at as a woman's field. Mm -hmm. And there will be a lot of people telling you you can't do it and, and, and not to even bother. But if it's something you're very passionate about and something you want to do, don't take no for an answer and don't let someone tell you you can't do it. That's when you need to push even harder. It is a very difficult field to get into, especially right now. But if it's something that you really want to do, like going back to days when I would intern, show up, show that you're accessible, show that you want to work and you want to put the work in and someone will take a chance on you. You know what I mean? Absolutely. If you're going to try and do, if, if, if maybe not in a major market like Boston, but start small, go to Providence. You know what I mean? Go to New Bedford, go somewhere smaller and just work your way up, keep plugging away and somebody will notice and some, it will happen. Just don't take no for an answer and just keep working, man. And, and don't say no either. If somebody's calling you and giving you an opportunity to do something. Hey, can you come in? I need you to alphabetize my, uh, my CD closet, which is something I had to do when I was an intern at my other radio station. Oh. It took me two weeks to alphabetize an entire closet that had probably 5,000 CDs in it. I took wow. so much pride in doing that. I went in for like, I forget how long it was. Mm. And it, when I was done, I was like, this is the best CD closet you're ever going to see in your life. And I just, just me being there and working hard and working my ass off, you'll get the opportunity. That's kind of really it. It's corny and cliched, but it's very true. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. It has been my absolute pleasure, Melissa. Thank you. <laughs> so much you can catch her weekday morning 6 a.m yes. to 10 a.m on hot 96.9 Romero, yes. Romero pebbles melissa keep up the great work and thank you for all that you have done especially in this market and even in radio in, in particular and keep up the great work that you do every morning on on hot 96.9 no thank you so much i hope i didn't bore everybody with this conversation oh, i just not. i i <laughs> love listen anytime i can talk about radio and talk about you know, things going on in the world and just in general it, it, with the pandemic and stuff like that and entertainment in general, I'm all for it. I appreciate you inviting me. Thank you so much. Uh, just the fact that anyone's interested in anything I have to say sometimes blows my mind still. But um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Again, with the self-deprecating, I'm working on it. I'm telling well, you. I, I know. No, um, no, seriously, though. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure um, finally meeting you face, well, video to video, not yeah. face to face. Maybe we'll meet face to face sometime. But yes. um, in the meantime, next time you go to Kowloon, man, let me know. I, you got you know, it. Maybe we can meet up and have some saga swings. You know what I mean? I'll give boy Andy a call, let him know coming in, and you know, it's all good. Absolutely. You got it.